associates uh, to Logan Square. And we'll start with uh, Tom. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm from Philadelphia. I grew up, spent most of my life in Philadelphia until I graduated college, where I graduated from the South um, as an English major. Um, went to the University of Iowa, uh, the writer's workshop for graduate school, um, kind of on a whim because I was afraid to get a job when I graduated uh, from college and uh, kind of fell into writing this book too, really. Um, there's a scene in, in the second chapter of the book where I follow a player around the supermarket and um, I wrote an essay about it that got published and people kept saying why not make it a book and so um, there it is I spent the next year and a half writing a book and now here we are at 2 Logan Square um, <laughs> How is the book faring at the moment? It's doing okay. Um, one of the things I was afraid of happening kind of happened, which is that it got pigeonholed in the market as being just a Philadelphia book oh, just and a just a sports book. book. And so we had a hard time getting coverage outside of. We got a pretty good coverage, especially in the area, in sports venues. We got a few call ins to sports radio, and uh, at one was at like 4 a.m., but still. Uh, did a thing on NPR, so things like that. But outside of that, it's been a hard time getting reviews elsewhere. But it's doing okay, and like I still, even now, almost a year after it came out, I get, I'll get an email, like at least one email a week from someone who read the book. Anyone else okay? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, from someone who read the book and liked it, or and, which has been pretty cool actually, because I've um, Eagles fans all over the place. I heard from people in Israel and Germany and France who tell me their story about uh, watching the games and stuff, which has been been pretty fun, actually. So, yeah. so I wouldn't say it's doing great, but it's doing fine. Mm -hmm. So not depressingly bad. How, uh, now this is obviously nonfiction, and like you said, you don't want to pigeonhole it as a, in the genre of sports, because it's really not. It's more of a, a humanitarian thing. It's human interest. To me, I got it. What are you following up with? Do you do fiction? Yeah, I, uh, my, my graduate degree was in fiction. Uh, my master's uh, it was in fiction. I never actually had an intention to write nonfiction at all. We have, let's see if I can say this in the shortest way. Um, at, <laughs> at Iowa, there's this weird schism between the nonfiction people and fiction people that dates back 20 years. It's, uh, yeah, and the nonfiction people have a real chip on their shoulder because they're kind of excluded from. The, the fiction workshop has a really great reputation, and they've gone out of their way to exclude the nonfiction people. The, ex the explanations are too long. We could get into it. But there's this thing, and so we had this rivalry, and we made fun of the nonfiction people all the time, and especially memoir, because it's kind of this. That's what everyone's buying is memoir. Everybody wants, and it seems like that's like this generic thing. Or, uh, a lot of people are writing memoirs who maybe don't shouldn't write memoirs. Uh, the New York Times had someone in the New York Times wrote this review that started. Uh, like Justin Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like 12 yeah, exactly. years old and you know, yeah. That never say never. Yeah. Um, he said that the New York Times review of a bunch of memoirs said started with the line. Let's have a round of applause for the lost art of shutting up. Uh, which I thought. Uh, <laughs> And so I had no intention at all ever of writing a memoir, and even still, some of my friends from grad school. Because you're not, you don't seem older, yeah. Older um, to write that. And so it just kind of happened. Uh, so I absolutely always intended to write fiction, um, which I find harder to. Not that I thought this was easy, but fiction is very hard. Uh, for me. I have a novel currently under review with with a bunch of editors right now. Um, within the next couple of weeks, hopefully, we'll be hearing from them. So. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to find a description that doesn't turn people off right away. Because right now, it's about a professional wrestler. It has nothing to do with that movie uh, that came out uh, with Mickey Rourke. Uh, it's about a pro wrestler basically going through a midlife crisis, essentially. Um, he's not popular anymore, and they decide to um, fake his death in the ring so that he can resurrect himself. People will love him when he comes up. It's supposed to be a very funny book. I don't know if it's funny. I guess we can see what the editors think, but it's supposed to be funny. You're very clever uh, in your books, yeah. Like, and you have the humor there. That's good. Definitely. I was cracking up on the train. I had one guy, like, like, are you okay? It's hilarious. It's just hilarious. Um, but actually, I have a question. Uh, you said that Sheldon Brown is uh, one of your favorite players. Uh, I didn't finish it. Um, a lot of people 
people told me I should send the book to Sheldon, um, which I was afraid maybe he would think it was really weird. You know. Uh, how cool would that be? Yeah. <laughs> but he, um, since it came out, he got traded, which was a really sad day. Well, not only because it was a terrible decision football wise, but just for me. Um, and that backfired terribly this year. But, um, there was this, this year, I, w I went to my first game. I hadn't been to a game in years because it's too expensive. Um, but I went to a game. I went to their playoff game that they lost this year. Um, so I got cheap tickets from someone. And, I saw uh, an RV pulled into the lot and pictures of Sheldon Brown all over it. And I said, wow, that guy really likes Sheldon Brown. And I was telling everybody, look at that thing. I wouldn't even do that, you know? And then about three hours later, someone said, that's Sheldon Brown's RV. <laughs> and even though he plays for another team, he plays for the Browns now, even though he plays for another team, he drives his RV to Eagles games when they're in the playoffs and tailgates for them. And so we, we ran over right away and yelling to him. And, um, we, we, he totally ignored us, which was a little disappointing because I feel like if you drive an RV with a picture of your face on it, right, you, you can't pretend not to, that you don't want attention. But, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't say I met him, but I followed him again. But he's, so. but he's, but he's invested in the city. Yeah, apparently. Even if he's gone. I was shocked that he was there. That was, and he had to wait in line, just like, it wasn't like he had back passes from a former teammate to get in. He was waiting in line with us to, go into the game and everything. That was that was weird. <laughs> I've never seen a former player like that just hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like when I was reading it, there was a voice, the male voice, and it was the male voice from Avatar, the main character. <laughs> and it reminded me of one of Yeah, that's a good question. Now, everyone has their own thing, obviously, that works. For me. I used to be someone who was, was like, um, I'll write at night, that's when I work best, at, which is what I hear. I teach at Temple now, and I hear that from my students. So I work best under pressure. And I realized eventually that was just a lot of excuses I was making to avoid writing. And, you know, um, I had a teacher at Iowa, uh, he was the head of the program then. He, we, I was lucky to be in his last class he ever taught. He died. Um, colon cancer, I think, while we were there, and uh, his thing was, you need to write three hours a day, every day, six days a week, he said, one, you should take a day off, it has to be every day, because it's easier to pick up where you left off, uh, like I'm kind of picking my way through a new thing I'm working on, but there's been a lot of stuff coming up, so sit, it sits for five days, and I spend a whole day trying to catch up with where I was, so what I try to do is, um, I try to do it every day, I get up, between 6 and 7.30, depending on, I do my best thinking in the morning, I mean, I realize now when I'm not tired, I'm going to have distractions and stuff comes up, and um, first thing in the morning, I'll eat breakfast, um, then I'll try to write for three to four hours, usually until about lunchtime, and then, um, it doesn't always work out that way, but that's the goal, uh, when I'm really going well, that's, that's how it goes every day, and I can, you get a lot done, I mean, by the time, you know, if I'm six days into the end of the week and I've written every day, I can write 15 pages. Not good pages, but rough pages, easy. You know, so, um, it's, it's a routine that's been working for me. Yeah. That's um, reading that does it a lot for me, where I'll sometimes through my detriment, where I'll read a book and I just, if it's really good, I said, Oh God, I want to do this thing. This seems, this is what I want to do. Like what started the essay I wrote that got published was chapter two of this book, The Confessions of Wild World Stuff. And the, players, and, um, the reason I adopted the footnotes and even the style in there is because I had read an essay by a guy named David Foster Wallace, who uh, is awesome. I mean, he's like, really in, deep, very influential in this kind of generation of writers. And, um, I'd never read him, somehow he'd been under my radar for years, and I read this essay called Consider the Lobster, and it's ostensibly about him going to a lobster festival, but it's 
it's hard to describe and make it sound interesting, but it's very good. And I read it, and it kind of, I said, oh my god, I want to write like this guy. And um, uh, David Foster Wallace, he's got, um, his nonfiction is a lot more excessive. His fiction is very experimental and weird, but he's got a novel called Infinite Jest that's like 1,200 pages that I love, but it's like, uh, not everybody loves it. So. But his nonfiction is amazing, uh, I think. Uh, and so for me, when I'm reading stuff, it, it really makes, uh, forces me to, to think about how I'm approaching the, the, the work. Like different like styles, like you're yeah. thinking of a different way to approach a in yeah, itself. absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, or yeah, even just seeing techniques that people are doing, it's oh man, that would work perfectly. Like, like as opposed to putting what happens and then backfilling the story after or leading up to something's met. Yeah, kind of the, the lead up and, and seeing like how people accomplish certain things. And, like, I, uh, a friend of mine had a short story collection come out, and I was reading it, and it was like. I think part of it is just a certain kind of maybe professional envy or jealousy or something too when you say, I want to do better than that, you know, and you get a, maybe if you're, you know, I guess to use a sports metaphor, which I do all the time, um, if, like if you're an athlete and you go out and you, you run a fast sprint, or a fast hundred meters or whatever, and then the next guy runs faster, you want to go back out and, and beat him, and so it's a real competitive thing for me with writing. Uh, so it helps to read other people who are doing well, which maybe isn't the healthiest approach, but um, that's how it works. Hi, we're back, and I'm here with Tom McAllister and his debut novel, Bury Me in My Jersey. And Tom, could you uh, give us readers' advice as well as writers' advice? Yeah, um, writers, I, maybe it's easier advice to give, uh, I think, because uh, I, I do that all the time when I'm teaching anyway, um, which is totally plagiarized advice from a former teacher, but that is be willing to do weak work. Um, everybody is going to write bad things most of the time, really, even even good writers. Uh, someone like uh, John Updike used to write, what, 1,500 words a day or something, that was his thing, and I published most of them, but that doesn't mean they were all good. Um, so, be, the willingness to do weak work, I think, is part of the process. You need to write a lot of bad things for a long time, and then eventually some of them turn out good, I think, is, is probably the biggest lesson I had to learn. And then edit, being willing to edit that weak work into something adequate, and then something pretty good, and then something, you know. Um, as a reader, I don't know. I think the, I mean, the only thing that readers should probably know is, is to be willing to... To buy books, one uh, to, <laughs> to, to, keep, to keep to keep us in business, but um, but to every now and then, I think what I like to do is, is to give new authors a chance, and obviously I have a vested interest in that. But um, it's something I try to do a lot is is try to find authors I've never heard of and just pick it off the shelf and give them a shot. Sometimes it doesn't work out at all, but then sometimes you find this person who clicks with you exactly, and, and, and it's, it's it's great to kind of discover that kind of thing. It's easy to make a connection with that person because they have so few people reading them. Um, and it's maybe more satisfying than it just like the New York Times told you that Jonathan Franzen is great, and then you read Jonathan Franzen's book, and you know. Um, and you're more accessible as a new author. Yeah, very accessible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you prove. Uh, yeah, I probably would have gone to Maryland, you know, to maybe the free lunch, and, and you know, <laughs> just pay me in chicken fingers. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so trying, giving new authors a shot, I think, being willing to just take a gamble on that is. Is, I think probably the most important thing you can do as a reader. Yeah. Try something different. And that's it. Thank you for joining us for our Cozy Slippers uh, discussion with Tom McAllister. And we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Oh, she wants to do that. She's so good.